This is going to be the best night, two nights of an NBA draft ever for the Baylor Bears. And we have Scott True to thank for that on Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Baylor, brought to you by Game Time and part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you for making it your first listen every day. That was my Dr. Nick Riviera impression. Wasn't was it my best? It was not my best. I've been watching a lot of Simpsons lately. Anyway, we are talking basketball today because this is a big day for Baylor. There are potentially going to be two guys going in the top 20 or so, definitely two going tonight in the first round. Uh, and so I brought on Ryan Hammer, college basketball expert, to talk through those guys as well as Jalen Bridges, who is likely to go tomorrow in the draft, uh, and talk about not only their impact and what he saw from them this season, but also looking at Baylor going forward um, and what this this team can expect with the additions that they have made. Ryan does some great work on YouTube. It was a, a pleasure to talk to him for this episode. So I always say without any further ado, so this time I'll say now it's time to talk to Ryan Hammer. That's it. Here with Ryan Hammer, one of the absolute experts on college basketball, specifically on YouTube, but a great Twitter account too uh, for for following for college basketball fans and someone who's become familiar with the Baylor basketball program. So Ryan, appreciate you coming on the show. And I, I'm interested to know with this new, you know, with how we have the transfer portal going now, we know for college basketball coaches, it's a 12 month a year job for you keeping up with all these teams. It's got to become even more of a job now. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, I you think that you have like some kind of off season? Like, I like the portal because it, in terms of content stuff, and it's fun sure. for us fans and stuff like that. But it's still not over. There's still been a couple of commitments in the last like couple of weeks, um, and then right into the draft. So I guess really the only time things relax is when teams go on like their summer tours and yeah. they're kind of on campus in in August and July and stuff. But that goes so fast. So it's nuts, and and even like. We've got guys now, so many international players in college basketball now that they've got some that are in international camps right now and might not come until the end of the summer. So it keeps you busy, that's for sure. Yeah. And you did make some time this year to actually come out and and visit Baylor. I know you've been an admirer of Scott Drew for a while yeah. uh, and, and the program that he's built here. But tell me about your time actually getting to campus and seeing the facilities and, and getting to meet with the team this year. Yeah, it was cool. Um, honestly, ever since the beginning of the championship season in twenty, I guess twenty twenty, um, I was a fan of the program. I love what Scott Drew has always done, and um, so it was kind of interesting to see him really bring this program to true fruition. Obviously, with the national title, but keeping them, you know, long term, going to be great. Um, I've heard a lot about the culture and even the town and some of that. I knew nothing about it from in person. I never even. I think I was in Texas for the Final Four last year for the first time in my life. Uh, so getting to Waco is definitely cool and even drive through Texas. But uh, I loved it. I enjoyed it a lot. You can tell it's a very like family oriented thing. I didn't have time to connect with coach. Um, I'm not on a personal level with him, sadly. yet. <laughs> uh, we I think I briefly said hi to him walking past. But um, everything you can you can get from talking to the guys and just getting the kind of vibes of uh, of the staff that I got to talk to and stuff is just it's awesome. And it really is truly, you know, basically a one of one thing where you don't see that in a lot of college programs. And I think that's why guys love to go there. They love to play there um, compared to other massive schools and state schools and stuff around the country. Like Baylor is still a spot that guys want to go and thrive. So, And you're someone, you keep your finger on the pulse of just about any program that's worth a grain of salt here in college basketball. And, and you've also, you do a lot of um, this, this prospect things before the NBA draft and looking at how these guys project. So I did want to get into that as kind of the, the beef of this, of this interview. And, and because Baylor's got three guys um, who are probably going to be drafted at least two, probably three, especially if you look at the mock drafts now, and it's, it's been a while since they've, since they've been able to do that. Um, what do you think about Baylor? Before we get into the specifics, what do you think about Baylor and the way that they've developed NBA talent over the last few years? Because that that's not something that that came right away. Obviously, Scott Drew had a lot to build on before worrying about mm -hmm. making NBA stars, but now they, they've got six or seven guys in the league every year. Yeah, um, it, it, and it's for good reason. I always point to like 
it's hard to put pinpoint words on it, but some kind of like grit and mentality of like, I don't want to use dog mentality like everybody uses for <laughs> everybody, but it is the truth. And when you look at guys, Davion is obviously like another breed of that kind of human being because he was that before Baylor, but Scott Drew and the Baylor system and winning so much kind of put him into that and got him to be a lottery pick, top 10 pick, even at his size um, and some clear limitations. But guys like him, even Jared Butler, who is in the NBA now and should have always been in the NBA and never had the issues that he had. Um, but him, Keontae, Jeremy Sohan, like the guys that are coming on now, they have some next level form of motor and work rate to them. And Keontae is actually probably a good example because I think if he goes to another school, like randomly pick, I'm not trying to pick on like Oklahoma, but like Oklahoma, for example, uh, where he was yeah. able to just thrive <laughs> offensively and just kind of cook. And I think he wouldn't be the same player defensively in two way and this have the same mentality and motor that he does now. Um, and I, I attest yeah. that a lot to Scott Drew and his staff and what they do. Um, so I think you find that in every Baylor prospect and you find that in the three dudes that I agree are definitely going to get drafted this year. Yeah. And it's all right to pick on Oklahoma on this podcast. I know you're trying to keep it neutral. You'll have other uh, obligations, but oh. uh, it's okay to do that yeah. here. Um, <laughs> and, and speaking of Keontae, because I think that's a good point and it led me into kind of that next one I was going to ask you about, because you were, you were early on the Keontae train last year. Um, he was yeah. someone who came into the year as a big time prospect, potentially a top five pick. And then he slips down to 16 in the actual draft. And uh, you you were one of the guys who you were making videos. Their shorts are still up there of, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I, I really like what this Keontae George kid brings on, on both ends of the ball and how he can develop. And so when you look at that, I'm, I'm seeing the same kind of thing with someone like Jacoby Walter, who is, you know, one of the top, if not the top shooting guard in the country coming into the season out of high school. And he has a bit of a slump in the middle of the conference schedule. And then, you know, you're starting to see him go towards even somewhere in the early 20s when he was looked at as a nailed on lottery pick. Do you see some similarities there of not only their game, but kind of how they've been perceived in these mock drafts? Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely in, in some way, shape or form. Um, Keontae last year, I, you know, I, like you said, I, I was very passionate about him from the get go. Yeah. And especially when the draft came around, I'm like, there's no way this guy should be going outside the top 10 right now. And uh, it's pretty clear. In their games, I see a lot in the shot making and the versatility of their shot making and definitely the difficulty of shots they're taking. Like when you look at the efficiency splits, there were not great for either of them, especially when you look at just like the basic raw stats from three and from, from range and stuff like that. Um, but when you watch their games, I know you watched more than enough yeah. of their games <laughs> last year and this year. Like those guys are taking tough shots. They're making tough shots. They play with confidence. And that's kind of what gets instilled in Baylor guards that are uh, I guess the quintessential two guard for for their program. Keontae definitely more of a true guard has is smaller for sure. Jacoby's longer and more of that wing. Mm -hmm. um, but Keontae has ridiculous passing vision and ability to create on the ball and stuff like that. Um, that I don't think Jacoby has as much, but Jacoby has things that Keontae doesn't have also. Y'all, I have matured over the last week and a half, two weeks here, and I've decided that. I really liked going to that Celtics game in Dallas in the finals, even though they got their doors blown off and a lot of you got to laugh at me for the day, a couple of days. I was really happy that I got to go. I got to be in the arena and that's lifelong memories. And I could only get there because of game time. Okay. I, I don't love the experience of any other ticketing website because they they're deceitful and they lie to you. Game time does not. You go to their website, you see the all in pricing, you see the price that you're going to pay before hitting purchase, no hidden fees there. Um, you get to see the view from your seat. You're backed up by the best uh, insurance policy in the ticketing industry. They will credit you 110% of the difference as a, a part of the game time price match guarantee and there was flash deals zone deals going on all week and it's the best place for last minute tickets so take the guesswork out of buying your mlb tickets this summer with game time download the game time app create an account use the code locked on college for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms do apply again create an account redeem the code locked on college l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-c-o-l-l-e-g-e -E for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets Lowest prices guaranteed. Yeah. 
And it's funny that you mentioned some of those things in there, especially the tough shot making because, and we talked about YouTube shorts. One of the first ones I made for Locked on Baylor was about the Houston game, which was the one that you were at. And Jacoby Walter made some like real NBA shots in that game where I was like, man, it made like over Jamal Shedd, uh, contested jumpers. I'm like, man, I saw the same thing with Sohan towards the end of his year at Bay where I was like, this, these are NBA shots that he's making right now. Um, did, did you see enough of that from Jacoby you talk about his his great shot making ability does that overcome you know some of the struggles that he that he hit as you know a freshman yeah and I think I, that's exactly what I was about to get at. like he's so young and look at every single young player especially the freshmen that are 19 18 years old like talk about guys like Isaiah Collier even Rob Dillingham and Reed Shepard have had their games even though they had unbelievably efficient seasons of shooting and stuff but they all have their slumps whether it's one game whether it's a half or whether it's a whole month or a week or something like that. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too worried at all. And I definitely saw enough, like you said, that game, he made some crazy shots. And the day before they were training, when I went down to link with Ray J and it was like Ray J Jacoby. Um, I forget who else is there. It might've been Jaden Nunn or someone just hanging out with them. And they were literally, it was just them shooting. And I was watching Jacoby kind of do his thing. And you can see he's an NBA shooter and wing and two guard and stuff like that. And he definitely impressed me. And it, it is seeing these guys in person helps a ton. I didn't get to see, 95 percent of prospects i got to see jacobia so which is uh beneficial obviously but um it, there's definitely that level of seeing that in person for sure and you mentioned ray j that was one of the guys you saw pretty intently there in your time at baylor and i think he was a fascinating player for the bears and i'd love an outsider's perspective on this because mm -hmm. when he comes to play at baylor we're, we're going to look at the positives a lot of us no matter what and he was kind of a different style guard that, or point guard anyway, that that Scott Drew has had. He, he wasn't really a combo guard. He was a true playmaking creator point guard. Um, and not that he was a bad shooter, but if he's putting up a lot of shots, it's probably not a good good sign for your offense. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, he was a guy who was an all Big 12 player. He was a conference player of the year in the MAC. Is a guy like Ray J. Dennis one that we can still see succeed at a high level in, in college basketball, the way the game has, has turned to combo point guards? Yeah, I think it, it goes to the coaching staff and how they build the program. It's yeah. not always easy to just be like, okay, we know we need to put X and Y player next to him because – X and Y player might go to a different school in the portal or they might decommit and do whatever and things are going all, all over the place, obviously. But I think there's definitely a world for that. The true point guard, like, because he is a he is a true point guard. And I say that in the best way possible, mm -hmm. not trying to just only look at the positives. Like, he has a ridiculous passing vision. His, he has long arms, his ability to make skip passes and see, see things before they develop and be a step ahead of defenses is second to none. So, um, I, I think there's definitely a world for that kind of guard on the college level for sure. He He's just way too talented as a ball handler to run an offense, even if he doesn't have to score. And like, I know we'll probably talk about it, but like guys like Jeremy Roach are very similar to that, where mm -hmm. I don't think he's as good in, of a natural playmaker as Ray J is, um, but he's not a two guard. He's a one guard and he's going to yeah. have to have those duties. So. And we will definitely be talking about Jeremy Roach. But before we get there, I do want to ask about Eve Misi as well. It's a guy you, you spent some time with, you did some some content with, um, and one another one that you were high on pretty early, if I remember correctly. I mean, he was one that was even being a four or five star guy was not on a ton of radars because he reclassified. Yeah. Um, he was supposed to be supposed to be getting to Baylor now, and instead he's preparing for the draft right now. Um, raw, athletic as heck but grew a ton of, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking yeah. throughout the season. What, what did you see from Eve Misi in, in his one year with the bears? Yeah. Those athletic tools are something else and his oh. ability at the rack and to vertically challenge anybody that's going to step up is for something else. He had a couple of dunks. I think it was that Kansas one early in that game over Hunter or someone or KJ Adams. It was, hmm. and I, it was, it was crazy. Um, I think he even put one that got counted called back at the Houston game, like 10 feet in front of me. And I was like, Holy is he's, he's crazy um but he he really has a lot of those raw tools i love his ability to put the ball on the deck too which you don't see in one in a lot of centers in general and two a lot of guys that he kind of fits like the jalen Duran, clint capella mm -hmm. kind of hybrid uh kind of player and those guys are usually just rim runners and they're not dribbling basically ever during maybe a yeah. little more but i think eva has really shown polish and development there and a lot of upside to to be excited about to give him a little more versatility offensively um he's also just a great dude like i'm happy i got to link with him because I, I think we were friends on like TikTok and I just reached out. I'm like, Hey, I'm coming down like to link with Ray J. Like if you're around, like, let me know. And we, uh, we got to chat it up and like you saw and stuff. 
Um, and it's good to understand and see, especially the younger guys, like who they are as people too. And he's very yeah. humble. He is calm. He's poised and he has a good head on his, on his shoulders and stuff. So I like to see that too. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned those two comps because we hear Clint Capella from everywhere else. Uh, he was, he said during, in that yeah. interview, if I'm not mistaken, yep. and those are guys who both came into the league pretty raw themselves and um developed developed and found a role pretty quickly and i look at eve the same way of like everyone's going to see him as very very raw but he can go to potentially a contending team if he drops into the mid-20s and really fill out a role and kind of figure out the rest of the stuff along the way so do you see uh eve Misi coming in and being an impact player uh, in, in year one or does that all depend on the situation no, I, I think he definitely will because there, there's a group of, I don't want to say, I think it's five bigs, give or take, with him as probably either the last one or second to last one getting taken that are going to be guys right away. And I think, like you said, depending on where he goes, obviously teams that need backup bigs like the Nuggets, the Bucks, the Knicks might need one if I heart, if Hart and Stein ends up going and stuff. But those teams are going to need a big. And if they take a big in the first round, kind of like Derek Lively last year, maybe in certain levels, obviously lesser, um, they're taking them to use them right away and, and obviously hope for long term. But a lot of the teams that are going to be taking bigs in the second half of the first round are going to want them to play right away because, like you said, most of them are going to be playoff teams. So, yeah. And Baylor is in need of some bigs for this year, but we'll see how that actually pans out. What they do have is a lot of talent in the backcourt. So yeah. let's get to it then. Jeremy Roach was was the big fish, at least in the backcourt in terms of things, uh, coming over from Duke. It was a bit of a surprise to us Baylor fans. It just wasn't something that was on the radar. We're, <laughs> we're not used to that going that big out of the portal, and I guess we will be now with, with he and Omir coming along. But – what were some of the things you liked about Roach's game? I, I know obviously Jared McCain came in and took a big spot, big role in that Duke team. And so it felt like the Roach role got diminished. But if you watch them down the stretch, it, he was still a key part of that team. Yeah. And I think it's almost like, I mean, he obviously is a vet. Like he's going to be a fifth year, I think, or if I'm not mistaken, maybe a fourth year. But he's a vet. He has a vet presence that every single team in college basketball, especially the Big 12 and power conferences in general, you really need to run your team, even if it's going to be a six man. But Obviously, he's not going to be a six-man. He's going to be starting every game and playing big minutes. But he's just – he's very sim it's very similar to Ray J in the terms of the role he's going to play in facilitating the offense. I think maybe there's a little more scoring instinct than passing instinct compared to Ray J, but he'll be the veteran point to kind of try to keep everything and hold everything uh, down and stuff like that. Um, his scoring ability is actually pretty underrated, I think. He's small, obviously. Mm -hmm. He can shoot it pretty well, and I think he just scores when the moment is right, so the volumes are never going to be that crazy course he might have like a couple of two or three big games because like every big big player is going to need to um but he's just he's steady and you need someone steady especially when you have young freshmen and guys like vj that are coming in that are the exact opposite that are probably explosive and they're right. going to be volatile and stuff like that um so it'll have it'll be good to have a pace setter yeah offensively that sounds like drew holiday to me which i get excited about <laughs> I know defensively that's a different animal but yeah. um looking looking at the kind of the transfer portal in general. Again, you're, you're on top of all of these kinds of things. And I was banging the drum after Baylor got eliminated in the tournament of, hey, you need to keep some guys around a couple of years. I know it's a luxury and it's easier said than done, but the teams that are winning titles are keeping teams together for a couple of years. So in your opinion, is it that simple or – or can you have a team that's built kind of like we're looking at this year's Baylor team with with Roach and Omir as two real experienced guys? Can you get to that highest level by having that veteran experience no matter how long they've played with these guys? Yeah, I, I, for two reasons I say yes, because one, teams like Alabama did that last year where they just have a bunch of new guys. Sears it was a transfer, it was his second year, but he's still a transfer and relatively maybe not new, but um, you, you can do that pretty easily. And also because – so many guys are moving around like half the entire country that was returning to college basketball was in the portal at some point. Um, so it almost gets to a point where so many guys are transferring in the current kind of state of the game that teams that have a lot of transfers have to succeed. That's just like basic math. Someone's going to have to win and everyone has transfers. So um, based on those two things, you definitely can. I do think that obviously if you have guys return like UConn getting caravan back and, and stuff like that, having big players return is huge because they are the clear leader. The coach trusts them with everything possible. They understand the system. If they were on a winning team returning, it's even better, obviously, because they've been there before. Caravan's a 
the top example of that for for success and winning, of course. But um, there's definitely value that that is added from long term returners, even if it's only two years. So. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could sit here and just say that Baylor blew everyone away in the Big 12 in terms of the transfer portal. I thought they did really well, and they might have the best. But, I mean, you look at Kansas. You look at what Kansas State did. Uh, Houston yeah. adding some some minor but probably pretty relevant moves. <laughs> it kind of goes without saying year in, year out. It's a loaded question. But how loaded is this conference as we look into the 24-25 season? Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Like I, it is honestly wild. And last year, getting the four new teams and keeping Texas and Oklahoma for that year, it really was just like this is unbelievable. Even yeah. though it was UConn who ended up winning, and the Big Twelve didn't do amazing in the tournament, but um, it, it really is going to be stacked and loaded. And I think a lot of the teams, like BYU, in my opinion, has gotten better. Cincinnati is going to take a huge leap this year, so those new teams are going to and UCF also like they're going to get better and better as they kind of go on and get adjusted to this. Losing Texas and OU isn't great. OU is probably not going to be good this year, so that helps kind yeah. of uh, soften the blow. But it, it doesn't really matter. Like losing two teams here, adding two teams there. Like you keep the core of the teams you kind of just mentioned, especially Kansas, Houston, Baylor, etc. Um, it, it's I the best scared. conference in the country. It has been the best conference in the country, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah, and so from an outsider perspective, because we we will always bang our chest to that best conference in the country, <laughs> no doubt, no close second. But like you said. It was a struggle in the tournament, and that's back-to-back years. I mean, they've had two teams in the Elite Eight the last two years combined. They were both in in 23, and neither of them made the Final Four. So is this conference too good, Ryan? Are they beating each other up too much before they get to the the big dance? No, I I think it's it's, – for the Big 12 last year, at least, it was kind of case-by-case scenario. Like Kansas, Bill Self said it himself. Like he knew they weren't going to do anything, and they were lucky to get out of that Sanford game. They probably shouldn't have even won that game, if we're being honest. Um, And I think Baylor had a tough draw from the start. I never – I love – obviously, I've been a fan of the program. I like the team this year. I never expected them to get out. Clemson was obviously a little bit of a, almost like a dark horse because everyone loved New Mexico like I did, but Mm -hmm. it was always going to be tough to get out of that little quadrant and get out to the second weekend anyway, um, where I look at a conference at the Big Ten and of each other to a point where it's probably detrimental and teams are, one, they're tired, they're banged up, they're injured, uh, and they also have only been accustomed to playing these dogfight games against similar teams now getting UCLA and USC and some Western Western Conference uh, or Western Coast teams, I think will definitely help that and and change the style of the league a little bit to be more versatile. But I I don't think it's really a huge worry. And like we said, like Houston also I mentioned Kansas and Baylor, but Houston cut the short end of the stick also, and Jamal yeah. Shed and stuff just kind of happened. So yeah, and Houston was the team that you got to see against Baylor, like I mentioned earlier. And we talked yeah. about this off camera, but now that we have you for the fans here. <laughs> Tell me about what was your what was your experience like in the Foster Pavilion? It was cool. So it was really cool because I got to see it. I went there the day before when there was not a soul in there. I think there was like two staff members, like a TV crew guy, and then three players. Um, quiet as hell. You got to see everything that it has to offer. And it felt small then, but it felt pretty big when when everything was kind of the noise was going. It was crazy. And uh, I think the game started at 11 a.m. local time. It might have been noon. Um, but it was early and I was like, these, like, it was rowdy. I loved it. It was packed. Uh, I told you for the seats are tight. Like I was sitting next to guy. I couldn't, I was like sitting my shoulder like this, but I was standing <laughs> at the time anyway. Yeah. Uh, it was really cool. The stadium's awesome. I'm happy I got to see it in its first year. First, realistically, like first two, two months, months really yeah. it was or a month and a half. Um, but it was a really cool experience and I've been a huge college basketball fan and I'm trying, I'm happy I can use my platform to get to new places and stuff like that. But I'm trying to soak in all these places like Baylor and get to the other Big 12 schools and SEC schools and stuff as much as I can. Um, so it was a it was a good start for sure. Mm. And Ryan, you are you are covering this 12 months a year. We really <laughs> appreciate your Baylor coverage. How can people find your work? Uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, social media is just search my name. It should pop up. It's literally me doing the sick and bear at the on the oh floor. Yes, I like man. people think I'm a Baylor fan. I'm not. <laughs> I have a, I have extra Baylor gear in my closet for I just have a, I have a ton of teams gear for, for different go. reasons but um, people think I'm a Baylor fan it's just a good picture and I needed to have <laughs> a real picture of me and not an animated one so for now at least that's what it's going to be perfect perfect well Ryan so appreciate you coming on today and we'll have to catch up with you the next time you're out there with Foster man for sure man I appreciate you having me.
Thank you so much again to Ryan Hammer. Some great insight there. A guy who was inside the facility within the program this year um, and certainly made a made a Baylor fan out of a kid from the Northeast, which I could definitely relate to. So appreciate Ryan coming on. And all our guests this week, Will Turboff, Drake Toll in as well. Um, we will be back with you next week recapping quickly where these guys go in the draft. We don't want to spend too much time on the NBA. Uh, and then looking more towards football commitments and and getting you ready for that season, of course, coming up. And there will be some sneaky baseball content within there as well. I've got some things cooking, okay? Anyway, leave a comment down below where you think these guys are going to go or what the ideal situation is. Are any of them going to drop to the Boston Celtics at 30 or 55? Probably not, but you guys don't care anyway. Who who are Who is your favorite team going to draft from Baylor? Drop that down in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe. Ring that notification bell uh, so that you can get alerted whenever we drop an episode, uh, whether it's here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Thank you so much for making it your first listen today and every day. We'll be back with you next week on your favorite show, Locked on Baylor.